May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. My dear friends in Christ, this is verse 23 from our first lesson today, 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Maybe as you stand here looking through the window into this widow's home, maybe you're thinking to yourself, Hmm, I wonder why God doesn't do this for me, too. I think sometimes we, we read through the stories of the Bible, we hear these incredible stories of, of God raising the dead, of curing the sick. We, we hear stories of Jesus' long-distance healing of a beloved centurion servant. And we think to ourselves, boy, if God could do that then, why doesn't he do that today? Because the truth is, our lives are a lot like the life of this widow that Elijah helped. We see death all around us. We, we see the, the refugees fleeing countries only to be killed in the boat ride over as their boat sinks. We know loved ones and family members who are touched by death. We see the, the physical scars of death in people's lives emotionally. But it's not just physical death, right? It's, there's another kind of death out there, a death that's really touched all of us. It's the death of the soul. We, we see that in, in the eyes of a person who couldn't care less about God and his word. And it touches our own hearts too as we deal with the wickedness and the, the selfishness, the sin that, that lives inside each one of us. Then we look at a story like this and we see how God deals with death so easily and, and may, maybe we cry out to make me alive, Lord. Of course, Elijah was no stranger to death. There was this horrible famine and drought in the land. God was punishing the land for its sins, for the sins of its people. Elijah had been sent to a widow, a, a Gentile widow, a non-Jewish person, and when Elijah met her, she was gathering sticks to make a fire and cook one last meal for her and her son, and then they were going to die because there was no food left. That was it. But Elijah came with a promise. He told her that God would take care of her, and that's exactly what happened. She and her son survived, and Elijah stayed with her. But then tragedy strikes again. The, the boy gets sick. Eventually, he stops breathing, and he's, he's dead. And the woman is justifiably upset and, and even angry at Elijah. What, what have you come here to do? You see, Eli the woman knew that Elijah was a Jew and that she was a Gentile. And, and she knew that the Jews always held it against the Gentiles, that they weren't Jews, that they weren't sons and daughters of Abraham, that they didn't know the true Lord, the true God. And so... The woman concludes, so what? Are you like all the other Jews, Elijah? Have you come here to, to stick your finger in my face and remind me of what a horrible sinner I am? But Elijah was just as shocked as the woman. He takes the son from her arms. He rushes up to the upper room. He pleads on her behalf, on, the, on, the, on behalf of her son before the Lord. Elijah stretches himself out three times on the boy, mimicking the, the healing techniques in those days. And he cries out to the Lord, and the Lord hears his prayer. He, he heals the boy. The boy's alive. The Lord was trying to show this woman a very important contrast. Like I said earlier, the, the woman here knew that Elijah was a Jew. But to her, the, the God of the Jews, the Lord God, was, was just one of many other gods that were out there. For her, she might have been worshiping Baal, she might have been worshiping Ashtoreth, or any other number of false gods that were out there. So what was the Lord? He was the God of the Israelites, but he was not my God. And so when Elijah mimicked 
the healing techniques of the witch doctors. He was trying to, to show this woman there was a difference. There were no spells. There were no incantations. There were no rituals. There was just a simple prayer to the Lord God, and the son was healed. The message to the, the widow was very clear, right? Only God, the Lord God, is the true God. Only through the Lord could there be life. But there was another group of people that needed to learn a lesson here too, and that was the Israelites. They, would be the, they were the ones that would have read this account of Elijah first. And just like Elijah was living at a time when there was a famine, the people that read this story were also living through a famine, but it wasn't a famine of food and water. It was a famine of faith. They had rejected the Lord. They had, they had worshipped the false gods. They had given up on God, and, and God had sent them his messengers. He had sent them his prophets, and they had routinely rejected them one after another. And so this story is really this sad sermon where God is showing the Israelites how he took one of their greatest prophets, Elijah, and sent him to a Gentile woman. The message was clear. The Lord is the only one who can give life. And by rejecting the Lord, by rejecting his prophets, they were rejecting the only one who could give them life. And so whether you are this widow or you are this Israelite reading this story, God was trying to share a message and that was, I want to give you life. Don't trade it for junk. A while back, my, my wife and I were replacing our blender, our faithful blender of many, many years that had served us faithfully. And so it had died, and it was time to find a new one. And, and we went online, and we read all these reviews. And we finally found a, a brand and a, a model that we thought, this will last and, and, and last us maybe just as long as the last one did. So we go to purchase it, and the clever salesperson convinces us to, to exchange that one for the store model, the generic brand. And so we take it home, we get it out of the box, and, and immediately we know this thing is a piece of junk. It's not going to last a week. So we traded it back and, and got the one that we had previously picked out. Why do we do that? Why do we exchange something that we know is good for something that's just worthless? Because we do it spiritually. Right? We, we take the life that God wants us to have, the, the good life, the life of peace and joy, and, and we exchange it for junk. We take the life of joy and happiness and peace that he would have us live in, and we, we trade it in for a few moments of pleasure with a thing or another person. We take those relationships that, that God wants us to have with each other, those relationships of love, and we exchange them for, for junk relationships built on manipulation, on anger, on distrust, on selfishness, chips on the shoulder, we take the, the roles and, and the responsibilities that God has given us in our lives, whether it's parents or church members or employees, and, and we trade them in for laziness and for just getting out of it what I want to get out of it. Just working for retirement, just working for that paycheck, just trying to get what I need out of life. But that's not life, is it? It's not, certainly not the life that God wants us to have. In fact, it just leads to death. And so God lets us see that death. That's what happened to that widow, right? God had to bring her right to the edge of death and stare it in the face. She had to watch her son get sicker and sicker. wonder how many nights... She lost sleep, wondering if her son was going to get better. Did she think to herself, my God, in this, in this God-forsaken land where there is no food, when there is no water, am I going to have to also deal with the death of my son? And what about you? Have you ever thought about death? You know why it happens? 
Do you know what it's all about? It would be good for us to, to wonder sometimes where, where we stand in relationship with God and what he demands from us. It's good for us to, to remember that we have in no way done anything to make God happy with us. In fact, we've done plenty to make him angry with us, plenty that makes us worthy of death. And maybe that's why this woman got so angry with Elijah. She was starting to, to realize that her life had been nothing but death up to this point. As she's standing there holding the, the corpse of her son in her arms, she realizes her gods haven't helped her one bit. And all the while her conscience screaming at her that this is really all her fault. And, and did she maybe even think to herself, did this man of God come here to point his finger in my face and tell me it was my sin that brought this upon me? And to, and to remind me of what a lousy person I've been? Did you come here, man of God, to make me mindful of my sin? How much lower could she go? And what about you and me? When we see the, the death that's all around us, when, when we see the death that even touches our own hearts and lives, what conclusions do you make about that? Perhaps a woman let Elijah take her son out of her arms because she realized she had nothing more to do. She, she was done. She had nothing left to give. Her gods couldn't help her. That much was proven even by the famine. But Elijah springs into action. Don't you love it? As he, he says, give me your child. And he takes this child and he, he goes up to the upper room. He's got to do something. Here's this poor widow. Lord, are you going to let her suffer even more by taking her son away? Elijah pleads on her behalf before God. Elijah is this woman's Jesus. Her intercessor, her mediator, the one who pleads her case on her behalf. And he pleads to God and God answers that prayer. God has come to help his people. Jesus has come to help you and me and to give us life. Whether you're holding in your arms the body of a dead child or standing next to his casket, Jesus comes to give life. Jesus comes and he has taken your soul and mine covered in the death of sin and he has carried them up to God and on our behalf he pleads to the Lord, kill me, don't kill them. Condemn me, not them. Punish me, not them. Jesus pleads your case in mind before our almighty God and our Father in heaven, God the Father, listens to that prayer because Jesus did it all right, right? He lived that perfect life. He goes to a cross and he dies an innocent death and, and he's raised from the death, dead to, to prove that he was that perfect sacrifice, that everything he had done was just what God demanded. And God gives you life. Death has been answered. You've been freed from guilt. And the death that you and I most certainly deserve forever has been done away with. Now think about what that means for your life right now. It means that right now we can take a step back from the edge of death. That, that life doesn't have to be Pointless. Life is not just some sort of model and march to our imminent demise. Life is filled with God's love. Your Elijah has come and he has whisked your soul up into the heights of heaven and pleads on your behalf. God loves you. It means life doesn't have to be about you. You can allow yourself to be freed from the constraints that this world places upon you. 
If I get the raise, great. If I don't, fine. I still have God's love. I still have the life that he earned for me. It changes our relationships too as we, we shift from selfishness to service. And life becomes the kind of life that God wants for us. Our souls cry out to God, make me alive, Lord, and he does. He's the only one who can. And when God makes you and me alive, we can cling to his promises. That's what happened to this widow as she received her son back alive. Now she could finally believe. Now she could finally do away with, with all those worthless gods that she had worshipped for so long and finally knew in her heart that the words that Elijah spoke to her were the true words of God. She had faith. She could believe. Imagine the happiness that filled that house forever after that. And imagine the joy that will be on her face when she welcomes you and me into eternal life. That's the power of faith. Faith is this, this wonderful power that, that holds on to the promises that God gives to us. Think of faith like a hand. A hand that, that somebody places something into. That's what God does. He, he places his promises of life and forgiveness and peace. He puts them into our hand so that we can believe. And that, that faith itself isn't our creation. It's something that, that God gives to us. Just like God had to give life and put it back into that boy and make him alive again, God gives us that hand, that organ of faith. So we can hold on to God's promises. And that's what makes them true. It's about trust. And boy, I can't think of anything better to have in this world that is so filled with cynicism and doubt and trust. You know, a world filled with, with the, the thoughts and feelings of why bother, right? We're all just a bunch of stardust anyway. We're going to die and back into the universe. Right? Why does it matter? Eat, drink, have fun, do what, do what you want with life. You only go around that one time, and after that, there's nothing, so why bother? Grandpa's not feeling too good. Well, just give him too much painkillers and let him die. Right? Doesn't matter. Return his genes to the gene pool to improve the human race. All that cynicism and doubt and hopelessness that's out there is changed in an instant by faith. Because faith gives hope. And hope reaches out to something that is far greater than what this world can ever offer us. Hope reaches out to the eternal life that God has set into our hearts and into the minds of mankind. Hope gives us joy and peace now. It makes life worth living because we can believe. Our souls cry out, make me alive, Lord. And by his life, he gives us faith to believe. Of course, it does mean that we still have to face death. That's all around us. There's no doubt about it. We, we face the same sin and, and wickedness that's out there, and, and we same, face the same illness and sickness that robs us of life. We see the hurt and the pain that it causes. But God answers the prayer of the soul, Make me alive, Lord, by giving us the life. The life that only he can give to us. The life that gives us faith. Amen.